Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers, by gamers. I'm Junglist. Next week we'll be back with a new presenter and all the news, reviews, and latest in the world of gaming. Until then, let's have a look at some choice moments from Series 1. Life's kind of funny sometimes, you know? Like one day you're like a super uber pro like me, and then the next day you wake up and you find out that you're like, you know, even more awesome than like you were the day before, you know? And... Pure Onage is an internet-only mockumentary that first appeared in 2004. Eleven episodes later, it's estimated they have over three million viewers. Jeremy Cole and FPS Doug have become internet superstars. Phrases like, boom, headshot. I am the owner and Uber Micro have become everyday gamer language. Largely thanks to them. Episode 12 is headed towards a computer near you. Ah, but before that, we've got Jeremy from Pure Onage. Welcome to Good Game. How you going? I'm doing awesome. Thank you for having me. That's really cool. Like, uh, I met lots of Aussies on, uh, on Vent all the time and all these games, so it's, uh, it's nice to talk to some more. So how do you reckon Aussies rate? You know, they're not so bad. They're, 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 they're kind of funny. I guess they, uh, it's like another Canada or something. Like, uh, they all seem to be pretty good. In the show, you seem to be a bit mad about being famous. Are you? No. Uh, to be honest, now I've, I, I kind of like it. This is so awesome. You, you so totally own. So can I, can I like, walk with you guys? Uh, yeah, I guess so, sure. As long as you stay out of the shop. Oh, like, totally, totally. At, at first, it was, it was a bit weird, because, uh, I guess, and it's probably common with like a lot of gamers. Uh, I'm just not the most socially outgoing kind of guy, and so it was a bit weird at first because I'm really not the kind of guy that meets a lot of people and, and so much you know likes all the hanging out stuff. But uh, so at first, you know, I, I, you know it was it was kind of weird. But uh, but you know we kind of exaggerate in the show a bit. There's been a few moments that have been kind of suck for me uh, because of it. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it's it's really really cool. Uh, you know when people come up to me on the street. Uh, and kids come up to me and they just, they're freaking out. They're just so excited to meet me. Uh, I know it, uh, it just makes me feel so good. You know, it just kind of fills me with these warm fuzzies. And So how does it feel to have given the world, boom, headshot? It feels really cool. Like, uh, it's really hard to believe, too. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, we got kind of lucky a bit, maybe. I, I don't know. Everything kind of happened at just the right time, you know. Uh, all, all Cal's film equipment and stuff was coming out. And it was all really cheap. And, and uh, you know, and there's all this sort of, you know, all these possibilities, like a, a BitTorrent, uh, is, you know, is, is a way on, online. Most people know it because they probably pirate a bunch of stuff using it. But uh, it's actually, like, you know, it's a really cool technology, and, and uh, you know, really affected how people can transfer files around because everyone sort of shares the load, right? So, it was because of BitTorrent that it really opened opened our eyes to the you know the fact that we could make a show that no matter how big it got, we would never have to worry about distributing it to the fans, you know? Boom! Headshot! There's a guy right there! Bust through there! There's a guy on top of the stairs! Guess what? Boom! Headshot! Guys come around the corner through the secondary valve! Guess what happened, man? Like, headshot? Oh Yeah! Headshot, man! Headshot! Do you still shove every shirt down your pants? <laughs> I, uh... I shove down more shirts uh, down my pants now than I think I ever did before. Uh, it, uh, it's weird. It, it started as... It was kind of just a, a prank on, on a few people. And then we'll pull out uh, Jeroni's order. And then basically, you know, I just kind of give it a good rub. What the hell are you doing? I'm increasing the value of the shirts, Kyle. What? By sticking it on your pants? Yeah, I rub all the shirts on my balls. You rub all the shirts on your balls? Come on, Kyle. Some people are going to love that. How long have you been doing that? Since ever, Kyle. I told you. You know, it just kind of started like that behind the scenes and just pretty much anyone we didn't like and did that, then, you know, we give them a special treat and uh, so we decided to put it in the show and then it just exploded and now it's like this, this thing that we didn't really, didn't really expect to happen, I guess, but... Uh, Tell us your true feelings about World of Warcraft. <laughs> well, I guess uh, my feelings about WoW, uh, I guess they're kind of the same feelings I have about most MMOs in general. It's kind of the whole the whole genre, right? Uh, and I do have experience with it all. I, I mean, I play almost every game, so I mean, it's not like WoW was the first time I ever touched an MMO. You know, I played EQ a bit, and I played UO, and I played DOC, and, and I played S in Star Wars Galaxies, and I, I, you know, I played a lot, but uh, my feelings about the genre is that it's, it's not really a game. Uh, I kind of see it more as a hobby, you know, something like building a train in your basement for fun or something. You know, you kind of just 
work on your guy and you invest your time and you put your time in and you just build him slowly in the background. He's kind of like a pet. He's, you know, he's this thing you get, you sort of get attached to your character so you can't quit, you know, and you gotta keep building him and you just keep building him like this hobby. It's always in the back of your mind, you know, but, uh, but it's not a game in the way that an RTS or an FPS is where it just tests your skills and it's, you can turn it on, you can turn it off and it's said and done and you kill, it, you kill a bit of time. It's, Do you reckon you'll be coming down under anytime soon? Yes. I think that uh, is absolute, uh, absolutely going to happen. Uh, as to when, uh, that's that's we don't know. Uh, but man, oh, me and Kyle, <laughs> we had such a good time in. Uh, see, I'd never been overseas before. I'd never been to uh, anywhere outside of you know Canada and the U.S. So uh, it was just so cool for me to to see uh, the buildings and the languages and the cultures is so different. Uh, it feels like I'm like in Age of Empires three or something. You know, it's like. I'm like waiting for the Janissaries to rush me any second, you know? <laughs> I really learned a lot, I think. I kind of grew up uh, quite a lot in those couple weeks. Uh, and I'm just so looking forward now to seeing more stuff. I kind of have this bug now, you know? I just want to get up and go. And it doesn't help that we get emails every day from Aussies and, and from people in Britain and Norwegians. And they're just like, come on down, come on down, come on down. You can stay with me. Just come on, come on down. Now, is it really all about winning? <sighs> you know, to me, yeah, it, it is. Uh, and, and lots of people maybe think I'm bad for that, like I'm not a good person or something, but I'm just being honest. Uh, it's, just, it's just who I am. Uh, I can't help it. <laughs> Anything I do, uh, it's always been that way since I was like two years old, you know. Uh, whether it was math problems in class when I was in school uh, or, or, or all the way through to gaming or sports or whatever, uh, I just I had to be the best. And if I'm not, I just get so mad at myself, uh, mostly myself. I don't just get my people. Uh, and it got to a point, you know, I, I compete so much that uh, pretty much I used to just compete against myself, you know. I would spend all those afternoons, and I'm 12, you know, I'm time trial and F-Zero against myself, doing all these things, just always competing, though. It's always just about winning, and, and uh, you know, that's just fun to me. W winning is uh, the ultimate fun. It's this, this big rush that I, I just love so much. Uh, but at the same time, I do know that lots of people don't play games for that. They play games to kind of relax or get away, and, and I, I, you know, I, I have to admit, I don't, I don't get that because it's not me. But I do know people feel that way, and I don't, I don't judge them too harshly, you know. I, I just, I just like to own them when we do meet. <laughs> Jeremy from Puronage, thanks heaps for joining us on Good Game. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's been awesome. Uh, I look forward to going to Australia, to be honest. You can't hold down a job as a game tester. I honestly don't know what kind of job you're gonna be able to get. Kyle, that was not like to advertise it at all. Like seriously, that was not my fault. Like really. Take your pony to the next water station. Brush her hair. Okay. Your pony died because it wasn't pretty enough. Ah! In a world where originality is but a mythical beast waiting to be tamed, the gaming industry strives to come up with the next new and exciting idea to keep you buying their stuff. Sadly, this is not one of those days. Okay, so next we have Richard Farkas. He's got some rather original and exciting game ideas he'd like to pitch to us. Original and exciting? In the same sentence? This I can't wait to see. Send them in. Gentlemen, do I have an idea for you. Now, when's the last time you played a game so original that it was almost in a genre of its own? Gentlemen, I'm going to make both of you very wealthy men. Please, continue. The game is called World of Alex Hempleton, or WOW for short. <laughs> it revolves around the life of an extraordinary man who works as a mysterious special agent with his brother Sven Hempleton. Together they are the Super Hempleton Brothers. Um... Wait, I I'm not finished. You have many goals and obstacles in WoW, which include saving the princess, getting each brother to level 60, eliminating the terrorists, disarming the bomb, building a base of operations, doing quests for NPCs, infiltrating enemy territory without being seen or heard, stopping the activation of a powerful ring-like structure... But... Guys, please wait a second, I'm almost done. Uh, pimping, completing puzzles, eating in general hygiene, catching one of each monster, defeating every cyborg master, fishing, collecting shells, and defeating the evil Dr. Robot! 
Bowser! That sounds awfully familiar. Shut up, no it doesn't. Now with all these obstacles, you're lucky that you've got some special powers on your side, such as the power of obesity, making you able to crush enemies by simply jumping on them, the ability to run really fast, uh, different class-specific abilities, time travel using magic dirt, uh, the ability to dual-wield guns, rolling into a little ball to get through obstacles, and for all you who are too afraid to use an HP system, they both have an energy shield that recharges when you hide like a little girly man! So, so what do you think? Richard, did you just steal a whole lot of ideas that have proved to be successful in the past and use them as your own? Yeah, pretty much. Now that's what we like to see. Where do we sign? <laughs> I think these Japanese games are a lot more to do with fantasies based on fantasies, not fantasies based on realities. You don't get many ideas about Super Mario in a Western game now, do you? You get Counter-Strike, you get you know, fear. In Japan, there is no boundaries of imagination. I think they want to get away from the very stressful society that Japan has. Japan's not a very open-minded country. Because of this, they want to break out when they're not working, you know. I am Flood, a flash liquidizer ultra dousing device. I hope to be of assistance. What type of games appeal to Japanese gamers? They like games that are couched in fantasy. Games that are whimsical puzzles, simple exercises that they can repeat, because it is about control. Even Final Fantasy, which is very popular, has a lot of abstract notions in it. The whole concept of the planet having a life force called mana, and then you derive your magical powers from mana. That is a really abstract kind of metaphor, yet it's something that they will happily buy into. That's something that also works for Western audiences. If you start from that idea, you begin to have an understanding of the kind of games that Japanese gamers enjoy more. In Japanese gaming culture, what's the attitude towards Western games in general? You do not say you play a MMO in Japan because if you do, it means that you can't work. <laughs> it affects your life so you can't work and they won't accept you on a job interview or something like that. Now the Japanese gamer does favor role-playing games and sports games, but there is a violent gaming culture as well. If you understand their culture and their history, then you'll understand why they like sword slashers and role-playing fantasies. They had a, a, an old feudal system, they all ran around with samurai swords, it's no different from Western games that are about the medieval culture. Western gamers do like Japanese games, but the same is not true in reverse. Uh, is that a fair statement? Yes and no. First of all, it depends greatly on the kinds of games that are being marketed to Japan. There are very few people in the Western market that has a true understanding of the Japanese gaming mindset. They don't understand what the Japanese gamer wants. What is it about Japanese games that appeals so much to the Western audience? I think there's this intimacy in Japanese games. There's a delve into the storyline. Um, it's, you can call it cheesy, you know, you know, Final Fantasy, you know. Those storylines are extremely cheesy, but Australians tend to be quite embarrassed about watching cheesy stuff. But they do enjoy it, you know. And it's anime. Anime is big in Australia, so... And there's some more extreme games which wouldn't pass the censor here in Australia? It's a stylized violence. You'll notice in games like Devil May Cry or Onimusha, it's a mostly bloodless game as compared to something like Gears of War where there's just copious amounts of blood spilling everywhere. It's stylized because martial arts is all about making the violence look cool. <laughs> video games, a lot of people write them off in Western culture as being childish for kids, for being cartoon-like. In Japan, they have an acceptance of cartoons and animation. They even have a whole genre for it called anime. A lot of Western game developers are always trying to pack in more pixels, more details, make it look more realistic. And it's always a revelation when somebody takes an artistic slant on it, like cell shading. In Japan, 
it doesn't matter that they haven't achieved a closer form of realism. As long as it looks stylized, and it looks great, and it's pleasing to the eye, they're happy. As far as we're aware, the Japanese don't play or develop FPS games. Why is that? It relates too much to the real world that's happening now, you know? Um, I think I think Japanese want to really delve into the fantasy world, and it, it, they don't get that gratification by playing Counter-Strike. It's really stressing for them, perhaps. So Japanese games have influenced the way in which Western games have developed? Without a doubt. For a start, Super Mario Brothers is one of the most influential games in modern game design. From that, you would not have Banjo-Kazooie from Rare, for instance. That was a phenomenon unto itself, but there were so many of the ideas in that game that were just ripped straight out of Super Mario Brothers. Uh, the Legend of Zelda, there are many facets of its design that can be seen in other action-based role-playing games that are on the market now. Fighting games also, I mean, without Street Fighter 2, you would not have Mortal Kombat. I think what you're finding now in a lot of game design is that there's a blend of different styles because the consoles are so powerful that it allows you to put in all kinds of different uh, game dynamics. I mean, if you look at a game like Grand Theft Auto or Fable, these are general sandbox action games where you just run around doing anything you want. But then there's character development as well, and then there's story. So then you have bits of fighting and you have bits of role playing, but it's also action and you get to shoot people and you get to drive around in cars as well and kick chickens in the town square. And that's something that both the West and Japan can, can really explore. Good game. World of Warcraft is one of the world's biggest online games. But recent rumors have linked it to devil worship and mass murder. Do these rumors have any basis in fact or truth? No. Did I make these rumors up just then? Yes. But what if I hadn't? A very real problem, however, is that of gamer addiction. Tonight we'll be taking a look at the lives of two ex-addicts whose addiction reached new levels. We were totally out of control. I mean, one day we came to school and tried to find a group to slay one of our teachers so that we could level up. The incident with the teacher was probably our lowest point. There were so many others though, I mean, every time we'd see someone walking their dog down the street, we'd freak out and think they were a high level enemy hunter. Yeah, Will's a nice guy. I've known him for ages. I haven't really seen him for a while, though. So what do you think of Will's World of Warcraft addiction? World of Warcraft? What have I done? <coughs> what have I done? What have I done? <coughs> do you know how horrible it is to have to go to the police station? To pick up your son, who's been caught running around the streets dressed as a mage, after having assaulted a 62-year-old woman while screaming, Die, Alexia! Die, you wicked fiend! I'll never forget the look on those officers' faces. It was terrible. Terrible. But it's not just World of Warcraft. Gamers of all genres are becoming obsessed with their favourite video games. These are just a few examples of the many lost souls that litter the nation.
for these misguided youths, studies have shown that addicts can make a quick transition from obsessions with video games to far less dangerous obsessions with heavy metal music. This process is extremely easy due to the similarity in content. Rehabilitation clinics have been established, which wean gamers onto bands such as Iron Maiden, Mastodon and Cannibal Corpse. It's good to know that our streets will once again be safe. The Roffle Cup, a tribute to one of gaming's greatest heroes, John Roffle winner of every International Pong Championship 1973 to 1978. Roffle met his match in 1979 in a gruelling 24-hour Pong session with Russian genius Boris Kakovich. As a desperate finishing move, Kakovich exploited Roffle's weakness and told him a joke. Roffle, hey, Roffle. Dragi, dragi slušatelji, ja. Dzień dobry państwo. Kort, kartu barata nikto. At times like these, we pay homage to our past gaming legends. John Roffel, we salute you. Here we go, Bob. We've got two players, it looks like, defending construction. AEF making their assault now. But, Bob, it looks like AEF are doing a huge armoured vehicle push straight up the middle of the map towards the TV station with GG Boy just stopping to take a few shots at Timber. Yeah, GB Boy could not resist. Here it comes now, Kugel with an APC bringing towards the right-hand side. Oh, it's very tricky up over the rough edge of the map here, Bob. Let's see it what Kugel like can do. It looks like it's pushed straight on the TV towers. Are the GG guys going to be ready for this? Because this could cause a lot of trouble for them. And Kugel's flipped the vehicle and they've all piled out. Here they go. We've got an early assault here on the TV station. It's AEF trying to backdoor the good game team at the moment. Jungle is coming in the front door. They've heard the call. Get back to the TV station. Oh. AEF's at the TV station. Jungle has cut down in the oh. fire. Here's by Masterclass Kugel. He was caught between two guys. Normally it's a good situation for junglers, but this time it wasn't. And uh, the AEF team are all over construction. They've got that easily, Bob. Construction's well and truly in the AEF bank now. And we've got a... Uh, it's Frankie at the back of the office here, Bob. Let's see what he can do. Yeah, Frankie in the Humvee. Oh, he's taking out Skonos. He's defending the office because here comes AEF. Five he takes guys out Hey, Seth Gonis. Oh, what a nice little quad there from Frankie, but GB Boy swings a big turret around, takes him down, and the office is under heavy assault from AEF. So you think you're doing pretty good in a Humvee, Bob, but that's until GB Boy rocks up in a tank. GG trying desperately here to defend the office. They've got players swarming over it at the moment. AEF coming in very, very strong. Mad Mock takes out Jimmy as well. Baron wins in the tank, takes out Grand Flavor for the good game team. He's oh, doing an awesome tank job. Tank again, EJ. Look at them behind. They, they're using uh, the buildings quite well to hide behind as they let it go. But there goes Junglers with his rocket-propelled grenade Down right under. into the tank of GB Boy. Now he's hiding in a bit of smoke. Oh, there's another one. Junglers. And Junglers did it. Junglers takes out GB Boy with the anti-tank. So the tank master Bob shut down by the mighty Junglers. Construction's in their control. Office is next on the agenda for them. The American flag still flying high on the office at the moment, but it's not going to be for much long. Watchdog has spawned on top of inertia there. Great work. AEF using every tactic in BF2. Jungle is firing in there with the anti-tank, trying to stop them getting the flag, but they're all over it like a rash. And it is the GG team inertia trying to slow them down at the moment. And he, he's doing his best, Bob, but he's like a lone man, a one-man army trying to stop AEF. He's got Junglist backing him up though. Junglist on the ramp here. Oh, oh, it out. Anti-tank versus anti-tank. Junglist cops a bit of his own medicine. Good game. Have uh, got a bit of a scramble defense happening. They do indeed. Good game. Falling right back here to defend this TV station. They're on a heavy bleed at the moment. Stone is picking up another there. That was inertia. Mecky Mecca from uh, AEF takes out the good game. Jimmy. Good game, Bob. Uh, Pins it back into their office now. No, it is not. It's the TV station. It, it's... Uh, Argonaut gets a kill. Go, Argonaut. 
In the meantime, Silver Wolf picks up a triple. Two of them kill. team kills. <laughs> classy, classy play by Silver Wolf. Baron wins with a double with the tank again. He is definitely holding his head high here on the good game team tonight. He's showing by example, Bob, what needs to be done, and he's about to teach Schoons a lesson. And he does. Schoons in the MG pit just gets blasted. And a AEF now making their way into the TV station. Jungleus is the lone man defending the flag here. What's he going to do, Bob? He has got his uh, rock and power grenade. He's taken a shot down at... Uh, GB Boy, now he's uh, ducked down out of the way. Proning. Proning. GB Boy has backed the tanker out of the way. And here comes AEF. They are downstairs and they are pushing up. Mecha about to come in uh, up the stairwells. Let's see if he can get in here because uh, Junglus is not facing the right way. No, no. Junglus defending the flag. He knows what the score is all about. The captain, the last man, last line of defense for the GG team. And oh! Jugglers just got DK'd by Insomniac's dream. He was doing his job. He's holding his flag. And then what do you know? He gets destroyed. Now we've got a player up at the flag here from AEF. Yep. Who's that, Bob? It's Scones. He's up at the flag. And he's just laying down some, uh, looks like maybe some C4 there. So anyone that walks in. Oh, oh C4 kill on Frankie. <laughs> Mecca, though, he's just walked in there. It's Christmas to Mecca. It is indeed. They're raining bullets down at the moment. There is C4 defending the door, though. Mecca's going to have to be careful if he wants to come out and try and ninja this flag. He's coming back towards the flag. Oh, he stepped on it. Oh, C4 explosion. Mecca is no more. And look at that. He's hanging from his foot from the rafters. That's a photo you want to send home to your mum. Here's mum. Here's me on holiday at the TV station hanging by my foot. Argonaut gets knifed in the back. Crashy, ladies and gentlemen, collecting a kidney for his souvenir kit. And it's the Argonaut kidney. It's not looking good for GG as AEF have got three guys up to this flag area. It's going to start capturing the flag lead is on. And it is it. all over as AEF have managed to uh, take out this Robble Cup. Good game. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely, sir. No, totally creams it on expert. Top of the server. Yeah, epic flying mount, tier five, nothing to worry about. Good, good. We'll get him next week then, Junglist. Next week, he'll be here next week.